So welcome to chapter two, organizing and summarizing data. Uh, I've added a new picture here. This is actually me standing um, on the north coast of Spain in front of a little island. Um, if you are a Game of Thrones fan, you might recognize this as Dragonstone. Um, and um, I wanted to just share as we go through this, I might change a few photographs just um, for online students who really don't get to know me um, in the same way as someone in class. I thought I'd share some different pictures instead of just icons and emojis. And um, one of the things that's become really popular for me is doing long hikes. Um, and in Europe, this is really easy. And especially in Spain, there's something called the Camino Santiago. This is one of the many routes through Spain where you can walk um, through cities and villages and nature and get well supported with very inexpensive hotels and things, um, specifically just for hikers. And this is a route called the Camino del Norte, and it walks along the north coast of Spain. I walked for about 30 days and roughly about 500 miles. And it's a wonderful way to see a country and to meet people from all over the world. So let's begin chapter two, organizing and summarizing data, specifically with section one, organizing qualitative data. Chapter one discussed how to identify the research objective and collect data. We learned that data can be obtained from either observational studies or designed experiments. When data are obtained, they are referred to as raw data. The purpose of this chapter, chapter two, is to learn how to organize raw data into a meaningful form so that we can understand what the data are telling us. The first step in determining how to organize raw data is to determine whether the data are qualitative or quantitative. Raw data and frequency distribution. When data is collected from a survey or designed experiments, they must be organized into a manageable form. Data that is not organized is referred to as raw data. A frequency distribution lists each category of data and the number of occurrences for each category of data. Let's look at an example that'll make this a little more clear. <clears throat> so example one, organizing data into a frequency distribution. A physical therapist wants to determine types of rehabilitation required by her patients. To do so, she obtains a simple random sample of 30 of her patients and records the body part requiring rehabilitation. Construct a frequency distribution of location of injury. This first table that you're seeing here, table one, is the raw data. She just looked at each folder or file from her patients and then focused on what was the specific um, body part or bot region requiring rehabilitation. This is raw data. It is not organized at all. You can even see that you have back, back, hand, wrist, back, groin. So they're not even categorized or grouped together. Once we start changing this so that we can see, um, so we can take some meaningful um, inferences out of this, for example, just we can see sort of that back seems to be occurring a lot. I see shoulder as well as happening multiple times, um, etc. But with it in this unorganized or raw fashion, it's hard to figure out what's happening. So one of the things that um, can really help us see this is putting it into a frequency distribution. This is simply listing each category, for example, back, and then seeing how many responses we get. And that's what you see here in table two. Um, <clears throat> here it's just listed by um, body part and then the tally. A lot of times we'll put this um, from the most to the least. Again, another way to kind of help us see the information because then it's, um, if we uh, organize this or sorted this table by frequency from largest to smallest, we would see that it's back, then knee, then shoulder, etc. Or back, knee, and shoulder are the top three body parts that need um, rehabilitation. So table two shows us the back is the most common body part um, requiring it with a total of 12. Okay. Now, you might look at this and say, oh, well, this is a quantitative um, study or quantitative data because I have numbers in it. 
but it's not. This is still considered a qualitative because the responses were all um, quality or, or non-numeric, I should say, non-numeric. So it was just focused on what part of body needs rehabilitation. Even though the frequency distribution gives us some now numeric or quantitative data, this is still considered um, qual qualitative data because we're focused on um, qualitative responses. Relative frequency is the proportion or percent of observations within a category and is found using the following formula. The relative frequency equals the frequency excuse me, divided by the sum of all frequencies. A relative frequency distribution lists each category of data with the relative frequency. If we look back at example one and change our frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution, we get a table like this. The first thing you're going to do from the table number two that we had in the previous example is simply to total the frequency column. Um, so that we can use this for the denominator in calculating the relative frequency of each term. And then what we would do, once you've got the total number of responses, then you would go through and calculate each relative frequency for each category. In this case, the categories are body parts. And so it's the frequency that that response was received over the total frequency. And so you can see for back it's 12 divided by 30, which is 0.4 or 40%. Wrist is um, two responses divided by 30 is 0 0.0667 or 6.7%. And then you can see the rest of them just there. But um, this is a really great way to look at, um, is to, to give a kind of a quantitative approach to qualitative data. The bar graph is something that's familiar to most people. Um, we've seen graphs in media and everywhere. So graphs are actually one of the most powerful tools. It's actually a concept that's connected to the XY grid and, and graphing um, and that most students are strong at in math. And a bar graph is consisted by labeling each category of data on either the horizontal or vertical axis. It doesn't matter. Some Bars go from left to right, but most go from bottom to top. Um, and the frequency or relative frequency of the category on the other axis, so we know how tall or how long to draw each bar. Rectangles of equal width are drawn for each category, and then the height of each rectangle, or again, if you're drawing them vertically, the, the, the length of each rectangle represents um, the category's frequency or relative frequency. Again, if we use the data from example one and put it in a bar graph, this also gives us a really powerful visual. And most people are visual learners and interpret data visually uh, much more quickly than we do um, through listening or through um, reading to some degree um, or tables. And you can immediately see here in both of these that the back um, here's on the left we have the types of rehabilitation and the actual frequency, the number of times it was responded. And then on the right we have really the percentages, if you will. Sometimes, um, and we'll get to see this in a minute, um, you know, percentage charts or relative frequency charts um, are done as pie charts so that you see like in this case uh, the back would have a, the a biggest share of the pie, so to speak. Uh, the biggest slice of pie, I guess I should say. But again, um, most of us are visual, so using um, graphs it can be a very powerful tool for increasing our own understanding, for us to make some inferences and to see the data uh, much more clearly and much more quickly, and then to draw some conclusions from the data. Again, this is nothing new to you. You've seen these a, a million times, but perhaps you haven't seen them built before. Example four, constructing a frequency or relative frequency bar graph using technology. <coughs> Excuse me. Use a statistical spreadsheet to construct a frequency or relative frequency bar graph for the data in example one. Here we can see that data pretty much the same as what we saw on the last slide with a 
a, a frequency distribution chart or frequency bar graph on the left and a relative frequency or percentage of responses on the right. These were drawn using Excel. This is probably one of the most common tools in business um, and in work is just to use cell because it's so easy. Um, you know, you just enter the data in the table form, which Excel is already in table form, the spreadsheet. And then if you highlight and copy the data and ask Excel to build you a graph or table, it will in, in multiple forms. Now, it is important that you have to be careful because graphs that start at some scales at some value other than zero or have bars with unequal widths or bars with different colors or three-dimensional bars, these can misrepresent data. Um, you know, again, maybe the percentage is, you know, um, 40 percent, but it doesn't start until the, it doesn't start at zero. So you don't have a relative um, for from zero to 100 percent. So this is just saying be careful. Make sure if, if anything is again, the, the bars aren't the same width. The bars are multiple colors. Sometimes things stand out in color. And um, again, if they don't start at zero, just be mindful um, that you might need to spend a little more thoughtful time um, analyzing it and it's not so clear cut just by looking at it, the inferences that we get from a lot of visual data. One of the most common types of bar um, graphs is a Pareto chart. And a Pareto chart is simply a bar graph where the bar, bars are drawn in decreasing order of frequency or relative frequency. Sort of what I mentioned earlier, that sometimes just by reorganizing the data in some kind of order from smallest to largest, from largest to smallest, can already provide us some um, insight and really can help us move the raw data into more meaningful information, even when it's just listed in a chart that way. But here you can see it as well, um, that sometimes this really helps because not only, you know, when things are relatively close, like you can see that um, wrist, hip, and hand look, I, I don't know if they're the same or not. They look like they're kind of the same, but they may not be exactly the same. And so the chart, the, the table of values going from largest to smallest um, would also provide us insight and to know exactly if they are, uh, are they all equal or is, you know, obviously risk comes before hip and hand. So or, to me, if these were all equal, then I would have expected them to have been put in alphabetical order so that risk doesn't take um, a predominant standpoint being higher in the chart, if you will. Okay, so this is again the same data we've been using since example one and a Pareto chart, that's probably something new to you, is simply a bar graph in decreasing order. Another type of bar graph that's really popular is called side by side bar graphs. And this is when you want to know whether um, when you have two categories, a lot of times it's by date, it could be by category, by preference. But in this case, we're going to use an example um, where we're, we're trying to figure out if more people are finishing college today than in 1990. Here we could draw a side by side bar graph to compare the data for the two different years. So here we have a table of uh, frequency distributions representing the educational attainment, um, both in 1990, which is this first column, and 2017 in the second column for adults 25 and older who are residents of the United States. Um, do note that this data, and this is always really important that you pay close attention to any kind of increments, and this data is in thousands. So when you see what looks like 39,344, this is actually 39 million, okay? So the data is in thousands. You have to add three zeros to it. Now there's a problem here or a potential problem in that when we're doing side-by-side -side bar graphs, we really need to use the relative frequencies because if we looked at just, let's say, that are not high school graduates, we'd say, oh, a lot more people in 1990 weren't even graduating high school. But we're not really sure if that's due to, um, you know, depending upon what our study's looking at, but notice that in 1990, we have a, a smaller population overall than we do in, in 2017. So um, in this case, it might work out, but if, if the change was different, if it was going from larger, um, you know, here we have uh, 
this 47,000 looks much smaller than 60,000, but as, as um, relative to the total population, it may be something very different. We're not just talking about total number of degrees when we're trying to compare different data sets. We're trying to look at like percentages of people. Did a higher percent graduate in 1990 um, or in 2017? So it's really important when you're using side-by-side -side bar graphs that you, you use a relative number or a relative frequency um, because of the different sample size in each. And so the first thing we're gonna do is, is to recalculate these in relative frequencies, dividing um, the total frequency 39344 by the total frequency at the bottom 158870, and that gives us approximately 25% in this first box and, and all of these. <clears throat> Once we've done that, then we can build um, the side-by-side -side bar graphs, and it's exactly what it, it says, you know, where um, in this case, the blue represents 1990 and the green represents 2017. So we can see the categories. So that we can see in, in 1990, um, there was a, a much higher percentage of people who were not even graduating high school. We can see in um, 1990, which is interesting as well, kind of it almost seems counterintuitive here, that a higher percentage of the overall population did get their high school diploma than in um, 2017. Um, in 1990, a smaller percentage had some college but no degree, and then we go through the degrees, and in um, 1990, a smaller percentage got bachelor's, had bachelor's degrees by the age of 25, then in 2017, etc. So side by side bars can allow you to compare the data, um, to compare two different sets of data that are evaluating similar things. Um, but it, again, it's important that you use relative frequencies because the overall populations of the sample sizes are indeed um, probably different, will be different. I can't imagine a case where they would be the same. So the main purpose of Again, you know, using graphs and converting raw data into something else is so that we can compare and also so that we can draw inferences. So, you know, looking at uh, the table, what would you say is your overall perspective on this data as it pertains to education? Um, we see that the relative frequencies of adults who are not high school graduates, it's about half of that of 1990. In 2017, a much higher proportion has at least a bachelor degree. And however, the proportion of the population with a bachelor's degree has not doubled as the frequencies show here. So maybe an inference that we could make or a conclusion is that adult Americans are more educated in 2017 than they were in 1990. Um, and again, this is the part, the rationale or the reason why we're um, turning just raw data into these different charts and, and graphs and frequency distributions so that we can make some conclusions, um, some intelligent conclusions based on data. As I previously mentioned, bar graphs can have horizontal bars as well as vertical bars. Um, you see them both ways. You just have to, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to put them side by side so you can see them and then see which makes um, easier um, to draw inferences from. Um, there's not really a definite, like this one I like because it's easier to see the categories and then compare them. I actually like this better than I like the other one, mainly because I can read these each categories and it's easy for me to remember that blue is 1990. And so like when I look at not a high school senior or high school graduate, I can see that, um, you know, some, less of the population in 2017 didn't graduate, so already we're, we're making an improvement. Um, it's interesting that less didn't graduate, but uh, those with a high school diploma is a smaller percentage, but maybe that's, um, I'm not sure if this was the highest degree attained, et cetera. I'd have to go back and look at the actual survey. And that may explain why there's a lower percentage with high school diplomas, but with higher with other diplomas. 
So I imagine that's what it is, is the highest obtained. But the whole point of this slide is just to kind of give you a visual um, recognizing that bar graphs can be vertical, as we saw before, and horizontal, as we see here. The last thing we're looking at is a pie chart. And again, um, these are pretty common. Most of us have seen these. We're easy at interpreting them. This is actually not one that's so easy to interpret, um, mainly because most of the pie slices are pretty close together. And so they've gone ahead and, and added the percentage. And I usually do that when I create a, a pie chart. I actually usually include the data there as well. Um, remember that uh, the relative, this is the frequency, not the relative frequency. So what we're showing here for not a high school graduate is the 26,000 divided by the 221,000, et cetera. I don't particularly like this pie chart. It's particularly dark. It's hard to read the bachelor's degree. And so when you're using charts, a lot of times you're using that to communicate your findings. And so you want to be mindful of colors, et cetera. Um, we typically use different colors for every segment, but to me in this one, it just makes it harder to read. And um, it, it's not particularly um, appealing to me. Uh, it might also be like we do the Pareto chart from top down. It might be interesting to put these in Pareto order and then, um, you know, see the larger pieces down to the smaller pieces. However, here um, they've put it in order of the degrees that you would get in order. So first, um, not a high school graduate, then high school, some college, no degree, associates, etc. Okay, but again, um, I think you, most of you know these. You're not going to be, while well, you need to understand that the area of each piece of pie or each sector is proportional to the frequency, um, the relative frequency of the category, but um, you know, you have technology that's going to graph that for you. You're not going to sit there and try to measure out, well, what is 12% of this size of circle, et cetera. Okay. So I think most of this is kind of reviewed for you, but it, but the, it's, it's one of the most important parts of, of, and one of the most valuable things if you're looking at statistics and most every job has some level of uh, quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis. And if you can communicate that effectively, and that's what we're doing here is taking raw data and putting it into some um, charts and tables that allow people to make, um, to get the information from that raw data more easily and more powerfully. And if you're good at that, uh, you know, that can be really an enhancement to your job and, and certainly um, make you shine among your peers. Okay. So this is the end of section one and uh, 2.1 and we'll see you in the next lecture.